Okay, okay. So, sorry for the sort of starting trouble. Uh, this is the panel on postmodern and post-human imagination in Abhinandranath Thakur. And we will start without much, uh, you know, more time. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Shantanu Banerjee, Assistant Professor of Ghazi Nazrul Islam University in Asansol. And he'll be followed, it's a group talk, but they'll have separate uh, times. They'll be followed by Shoykot Chakraborty, who is a PhD student in the same university. The name of their uh, duo talk is Post-Human Imagination in Abhinandranath Thakur's Theoretical Writings. So, Dr. Banerjee, please go ahead and start. Uh, am, I, am I clearly audible? And yes, yes, yes. You are yes. clearly audible. Okay, so hi everybody there. A very good morning to all of you. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm, How are you? I'm fine, thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English in Kazi Nazrul University. And uh, I, along with my colleague, student, and uh, co-researcher, Shaikot Chakravarti would present in this panel uh, our paper, our presentation, and uh, the title of our presentation is Post Human Imagination in Urban Indranath. So, may I now request Shaikot to share the slides? I don't have the slides, so Shaikot, please help me by sharing the slides. Yeah, uh, sir, am I audible? Uh, am I yes, properly yeah. audible? Yeah, yes, sure. yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Just give me a second. I'm just sharing the slide. Yes, yes. So, without much ado, let us begin with our discussion. Uh, in our presentation, we shall discuss a couple of Avanindranath's art writings, uh, namely Banglar Broto, the Brotos of Bengal, which was published in 1919 and uh, Bageshwari Shilpa Prabhundhavali, uh, which was actually a series of endowment lecture delivered at Calcutta University by Abhinandranath during the period 1920 to 1929. Subsequently, those lectures were published as a book in 1941. So, uh, the first text, Bangla Broto, is uh, actually an introduction to the folk rituals, uh, beliefs, art and culture of rural and agrarian Bengal. Shoikot will speak mostly on it. I shall chiefly focus on the second text, that is Bageshwari. And it is uh, perhaps Avanindranath's most famous literary work in the art world. And uh, it is generally understood as the compendium of his basic views on art. His views on artists, his views on the world in which art is created, alongside the material of art, art techniques, and the audiences uh, or, or uh, the people who appreciate the art. So all of these things are in fact covered in that one book, Bhagishwari Shilpa Prabhundhavu. It may be called Avunindranath's magnum opus in the art world. But before entering into any discussion in this area and on this book particularly, I would uh, like to quote, first of all, from Bhagishwari, the first chapter of Bhagishwari. And that chapter is called Shilpe Onodhika. Uh, I won't translate this quote in Bengali purposefully. And then I shall quote from another book, which is far, far away from art. It is in fact a book on physics, and it is written by Carlo Rovelli, one of the leading scientists of our time working in the field of quantum gravity. The title of the book is Seven Brief Lessons on Physics. Yes, so let me quote first of all uh, from Avunindranath Tagore's Bhageshwari Shilpa Pravandhavali, Shilpe Onadhikar. 
শিল্পলোকের যাত্রাপথে এই যে একটা মোহপাস রয়েছে চিরাগত প্রথার অনুসরণ প্রিয়তা সেটাকে কাটিয়ে যাবার শিল্পশাস্ত্র বৈদিক ঋষিরা আমাদের দিয়ে গিয়েছেন মানুষের নির্মিত এই সমস্ত খেলনা সামগ্রী এই হস্তি কাংশ বস্ত্র হিরণ্য অশ্বতরী যুক্ত রথ প্রভৃতি যে শিল্প সমস্তই দেব শিল্পের অনুকরণ মাত্র একে শিল্প বলা চলে না এ তো দেব শিল্পী দ্বারায় করা হয়ে গেছে মানুষের কৃতিত্ব এর মধ্যে কোথায় এ তো শুধু প্রতিকৃতি নকল করা হলো মাত্র যে যজমান শিল্পী দেব শিল্পীর পরে এলে মামলা সুতরাং আমাদের করাটা নামে মাত্র অনুকৃতি বলে ধরা যায় কিন্তু আমাদের কাজে সৃষ্টির কৃতিত্ব যেখানে সেখানে মানুষের শিল্পের সঙ্গে দেব শিল্পের রচনার উপায়ের মধ্যে পার্থক্য কোথাও নেই শুধু সেটি পরে করা হয়েছে অনুকৃত হয়েছে মাত্র এই রহস্য জানো এ যে জানে সকল শিল্পই তার অধিকারে আসে শিল্প তার আত্মার সংস্কার সাধন করে এই যে শিল্প এমন যে শিল্পশাস্ত্র কেবল তারই দ্বারায় যজমান নিজের আত্মাকে ছন্দময় করে যথার্থ যে সংস্কৃতি তাই লাভ করে এবং প্রাণের সঙ্গে বাক্যকে চক্ষুর সঙ্গে মনকে শ্রোত্রের সহিত আত্মাকে মিলিত করে যতদিন মানুষ জানেনি তার নিজের মধ্যে কি চমৎকারিণী শক্তি রয়েছে সৃষ্টি করবার ততদিন সে তার চারিদিকের অরণ্যানীকে ভয় করে চলেছিল পর্বত শিখরকে ভাবছিল দুরারোহ ভীষণ বিশ্বরাজ্যের উপরে কোন প্রভুত্বই সে আশা করতে পারছিল না তার কাছে সমস্তই বিরাট রহস্যের মতো ছিল সে চুপচাপ বসেছিল কিন্তু যেদিন শিল্পকে সে জানলে সেই মুহূর্তেই তার মন ছন্দময় বেদময় হয়ে উঠল রহস্যের দ্বারে গিয়ে সে ধাক্কা দিলে সবলে মানুষ তার আত্মাকে রূপ রং ছন্দ সুর গতি মুক্তি সব দিয়ে ছড়িয়ে দিলে বিশ্ব রাজ্য এমন যে শিল্প এত বড় যে শিল্প তারই অধিকার ঋষিরা বলেছেন নাও আর আমরা বলছি না না ও পাগলামি খেয়াল থাক চাকরির চেষ্টা করা যাক ওইটুকু হলেই আমরা খুশি ঋষিরা বললেন এ কি এ কি তুচ্ছ চাওয়া নালপে সুখমস্তি আমরা বললুম অল্পেই আমি খুশি নাও আই কোট ফ্রম কার্লো রোভ্যালি দ্যাট ইজ দ্য লাস্ট চ্যাপ্টার অফ হিজ বুক সেভেন ব্রিপ লেসন and rovelli writes nature is our home and in nature we are at home this strange multicolored and astonishing world which we explore where space is granular time doesn't exist and things are nowhere it is not something that estranges us from our true selves for this is only what our natural curiosity reveals to us about the place of our dwelling about the stuff of which we ourselves are made we are made of the same star dust of which all things are made and when we are immersed in suffering or when we are experiencing intense joy we are being nothing other than what can't help but be a part of our world there are frontiers where we are learning and our desire for knowledge for they are in the most minute reaches of the fabric of space at the origins of the cosmos in the nature of time in the phenomenon of black holes and in the workings of our own thought processes here on the edge of what we know in contact with the ocean of the unknown shines the mystery and the beauty of the world and it is breathtaking so our presentation will primarily be a sort of explanation a sort of elucidation of these two thoughts we are really thankful to the organizers and especially to professor devashish banerji for giving us a chance to speak on avindranath tagore uh, we feel really proud today and really honored but uh, why should we speak on the post humanist imagination of avindranath tagore we all know and know very well that uh, avanindranath belonged to the great house of tigors in jorashanko which was one of the breeding grounds of humanism 
that came to India from the West with new learning. New learning, it came with English. And the Tagore <laughs> were, however, not wholesale consumers of this humanism, which came hand in hand with colonialism, no doubt, and also with modernity, our modernity. Dr. Banerjee, there is another person. Anirban Banerjee, can you please mute yourself? Voices are coming from your... Uh, Anirban Banerjee, can you please mute yourself? Yes, thank you. So the Tagores were not wholesale consumers of humanism and modernity. They received the new train after thorough judgment and then assimilation and they accepted this new train according to the needs of their own culture without hesitating at times to adopt after making necessary changes as well as transformations. So that is the beauty, in fact, of our modernity. And uh, the Tagores, like Rabindranath Tagore or other Tagores, Rabindranath Tagore's grandfather, Varkanath Tagore as well, who was an entrepreneur, not, was a, not a very prominent name, uh, I don't know the reason, but uh, not a very prominent name in the world of culture. They added new features in the discourse of humanism and modernity. I have recently discussed this issue in one of my book chapters focusing on the noted Bengali musician and musicologist Dilip Kumar Rai uh, in the context of his conversation with Rabindranath Tagore. So, to put it simply, humanism came to India. Humanism came to Bengal, and uh, humanism uh, is something which emphasizes human welfare and upholds human dignity. Now, it is often optimistic about the power of human reason. It was against anything dark, and in that sense medieval. It was a renewed interest in the study of classical literature, art, and architecture. And it was also a sort of rediscovery of the unity of human beings and nature. That is very important. But we must not forget that by the time Abhinindranath Tagore delivered his Bageshwari lecture, I help you remember the time, 1921 to 1929, the basic ideals of humanism were denied in the West. The First World War already shook the foundation of the belief in the goodness of human beings. And in the colonies especially, India was a colony, humanism was not practiced by the colonizers in their dealings with the colonized. And it is quite obvious. So, humanism as we can understand from this very point, gave birth to dehumanization. The world was filled with fractured, splintered, and I must say diminutive human beings. And this dehumanization, in fact, provides the context for Avurindranath's Bhageshwari lectures. And it also prepares the ground for us in today's presentation. So, over many decades, Avanindranath has been discussed as a nationalist. And uh, Avanindranath's art has been described as the art of nationalism. One reason we all know is obvious, his famous painting, Bongomata, which came in the year 1902 and which was adopted by the nation as Bharat Mata, thanks to Sister Nivedita and many others. And it is quite clear that gradually the Snehomoyi Mata, the caring mother, with onno, food, bostro, clothing, shiksha, education, diksha, 
initiation and tyaga sacrifice became the powerful mother india which avanindranath probably uh, couldn't dream of and uh, he was influenced no doubt uh, by the swadeshi movement but his swadesh was multicultural multilingual tolerant and progressive professor devashish banerjee has already written a book on this so i won't speak much on this avanindranath never blindly supported nationalism and to be more precise in bageshwari he went to the extent of dissociating art from nationalism he said that uh, in in a nationalist garden in a nationalist botanical garden uh, flowers never bloom with the air provided by the nation so avanindranath cannot be so easily leveled as a nationalist and the very year he painted the famous painting of bongo mata he also painted the painting of the death of shah jahan and as we find in his arabian night scenes uh, i i uh, have one picture in my slide where you can find the dakshiner baranda the southern veranda of the tigor household was transmuted uh, into uh, sindabad the sailors drawing room where one may find an englishman an african uh, people from the mongolian origin the picture at the center in this slide so it it talks about the pluralism the multiculturalism which is at the very heart of avanindranath's concept of nation but through the years uh, 1920 to 1940 which in fact coincide with uh, avanindranath's bageshwari lectures and its publication where suddenly the decades of nationalist movement gaining momentum in india and uh, though it happens avanindranath's essays are to be read by us as his protest against dehumanization dehumanization as caused by colonialism i would like to request shrikot to move to the next slide please so dehumanization caused by colonialism to the next slide please shrikot to the next slide please dehumanization caused by colonialism Sir, i have already moved is it visible to you i think this no. is the slide no okay dehumanization promoted by capitalism and dehumanization nurtured in art in the pretext of uh, what we can say academic realism avanindranath clearly opposed these forces and uh, he was also very much aware of the fact that uh, dehumanization can also continue under nationalism and uh, we understand it quite clearly today that he was probably not wrong colonialism separated us from our roots capitalism turned us into tools of mechanical production and academic realism which was imposed on us by the colonial masters in the art schools taught us to copy the external world avanindranath clearly opposed all of these things and while he was opposing these things he got several supports one support was definitely from those people uh, who derived their ideas or unique call ideology from the art and crafts movement taking place in britain uh namely avanindranath's guru eb havel and uh, sister nivedita and anand kentish kumar swami and also os ganguli obviously havel nivedita kumar swami and os ganguli all were influenced by the arts and crafts movement but uh, they interpreted uh, arts and crafts movements uh, chief uh, uh, philosophy or idea on slightly different terms uh, kumar swami uh, specifically attached it to nationalism and so was nivedita but uh, havel was not of that sort 
none was O.C. not not even O.C. Ganguly. So Abhinandranath came in contact, we can say, with arts and crafts movements with these these people, with these figures, and again Sister Nivedita put him into contact with the Nihonga school of artists, especially with Kakuzo Kakura or Kakura Tenj. And uh, we all know in the art world very clearly that uh, these Nihonga artists were in fact trying to understand the, the real worth of their root while uh, realizing the very need of modernizing their culture. So they wanted to carry their tradition forward in the world of modernity. So that was their battle and they wanted to retain their Japanese identity. So Okakura was the spokesperson, was a sort of leader of the Nihonga school who came to Kolkata, to India several times and Abhinindranath got the chance of hobnobbing with Okakura, learning a great deal, especially the wash technique from the Japanese artists. And finally, whom we must mention, uh, a very prominent impact on Abhinindranath certainly was Robindranath Tagore, the great poet, Abhinindranath Tagore's uncle. Shimar Mudde Oshim, to understand the infinite within the bonds of finite, was something probably which Abhinindranath learned from Robindranath alongside many other things, say, for example, cosmopolitanism, say, for example, multiculturalism, and say, for example, love towards nature. All of these things probably came to Abhinindranath uh, to some extent from Rabindranath Tagore. So Abhinindranath, protesting against humanity, uh, dehumanization uh, in Bhageshwari Shilpa Prabhandavali always speaks in favor of the freedom of the soul of man in both form and content of Bhageshwari. He reiterates this conviction of human freedom. And in this sense, though we are discussing everything in the context of post-humanism, Abhinindranath's Bhageshwari is a humanist text, humanist uh, in a special sense, in a different sense, not uh, the sense which one may borrow wholesale from the West, but a new sort of humanism we may find emerging in Abhinindranath's lectures. And though this quest for human freedom takes him uh, uh, to this world of human beings, it also takes him beyond it, beyond the conventions of human boundaries. And uh, uh, while reading Bhageshwari, we may think time and again whether this crossing the boundaries, conventional human boundaries, can help us think of Anindranath's views in the context of post-humanism. So, let us Focus on Bhageshwari Shilpa Prabhandhavali, the basic features which we have pointed out, which can be discussed in the light of post-humanism. Now, Bhageshwari Shilpa Prabhandhavali are all academic lectures, endowment lectures delivered by Abhinindranath in the university hall and in front of the vice chancellor and many other dignitaries. Yet, these academic lectures are extremely informal in tone. So he can mix the sublime with the trifle. He can place on the same table hyacinths and biscuits. This is really interesting. And as he wrote Bhageshwari, we must uh, say that he was not in fact writing, he was speaking. This is rendered in prose, but this prose is highly poetic in nature. The images and, uh, you know, various other things, which we have rhythm, they rush and tumble uh, throughout his prose. He is speaking chiefly about art, but he touches upon almost all aspects of life, be it wedding, uh, be it uh, service, 
uh, be it politics, uh, be it food, everything. He focuses on Indian art, art in India, but makes several references to global art. You find quotes from Goethe, from Schiller, from Kandinsky, from Roda, etc., etc. And while talking about painting as a form of art, chief form of art, he takes help from the world of poetry. Now, I must mention two poets. One is Kabir and the other is Rabindranath, who are very prominent uh, in this Bhageshwari lectures. Kabir was a medieval mystic poet. And his mysticism, which in fact talks about the relationship of the creator and the world of creation, are used strategically, I must say, by Aurobindo Tagore in order to discuss some basic ideas of art. I shall talk on this in due course. And also Aurobindo about human beings' relationship with the external world. Aurobindo discusses artist as an individual. He always remained as an individual. But he also represents the problems and possibilities of the society. Some critics are there who say Abhinindranath never paid attention to social problems. This is completely wrong. The mistaken view. It is a mistake. Abhinindranath didn't directly talk about the society but he was very much conscious of the things happening around him. And his Bhageshwari lectures at, at various places responds to those problems and possibilities of human beings living in human society. Now, all of these things are there in Bhageshwari Shilpa Prabhandhabali. But when we talk specifically about art, we must take into our account four primary criteria, primary features of art. One is called Rupa, and we have with it Chanda. We have the third one, Rekha, and along with Rekha, Varna. And we find a very interesting interplay between Rupa and Chanda, Rekha and Varna. Certain Words are culture-specific and cannot be translated, but we can translate Rupa into form, the world of form, which is in fact needed primarily by an artist to create his art. And with his eyes open, he sees the world outside and understands the forms, myriad forms in that world. And also understands the forms, learns it, copies it, but this external world copied was not welcome for Abhinindranath Tagore as he said that this copy is not sufficient. We receive the external world within ourselves and then we respond to it and a rhythm is created, is chanda is created. What is without comes within, what is within then get mixed with what is received and ultimately art in its own rhythm, in its own chando is born. Form can be captured in Rekha. Rekha is very important. Line. Western academic art focused on drawing. Avanindranath also focused on drawing, but drawing was not everything for him. Because uh, he knew, like any other modernist, that drawing to an extent is needed, but one should know how to break away from it, how to cross the limits of Rekha of line. And much more important is Varna or color because the world outside has no lines. It is made of colors. And when colors interplay, they, the difference of intensity between colors treat the illusion of line. It is very much there in Bhageshwari. So, Alongside the interplay of formal and informal, the poetic and the prose uh, of art and society, we also have the interplay of Rupa and Chanda. We have the interplay of 
Rekha and Varun. And all of these things, all of these aspects can be put under one, you know, one headline, under one heading, the interplay of the human and the non-human, the self and the non-self. Now, Kabir is invoked by Obanindranath Tagore, and I quote from a very famous verse of Kabir, uh, which is there not only in Bhageshwari but in many other texts written by Obanindranath. Ham tum do tumb, tumb which is sur, baje taja taja, ujara kabahi kajara kabahi, rang rang nit vaja. The imagery of a beena, a stringed instrument, is used by Kabir, and the two gods, the voice boxes which one may find in the veena, they are like the self and the non-self, the within and the without, and the and the harmony, the melody, the music is created between the two. Something, uh, sometimes it is dark, sometimes it is full of light, sometimes it is colorful, but this relationship has to be established between within and without. And here is the joy of creation, Ananda. And Abhinindranath quotes from the famous song by Rabindranath Tagore, Ki Anundo, Ki Anundo, Ki Anundo, Dibaratri, Nache Mukti, Nache Bondha. What a bliss, what a bliss, what a bliss it is when I find the liberty, the freedom, and the limits of freedom, both are dancing together in a rhythm. The entire text of Bhagishwari may seem like a tissue of quotations, quotations from Sanskrit aestheticians, quotations from artists, quotations from rhymes and doggerels, folk rhymes and folk doggerels, and also anecdotes, personal anecdotes, interesting stories, extremely enjoyable. I would like to quote in this context one sloka which is there originally in the Kabya Prakasha of Mammata. It is there in the first chapter, Shilpya Rodhikar. Avanindranath wrote, Niyati Krita Niyama Rahitang, quoting from Mammata, Niyati Krita Niyama Rahitang, Ladeika Mai Ananya Paratantram, Navarasa Ruchirang Nirmiti Madhadati, Varati Kaveir Jayati. In new colors, in new rhythms, all boundaries are crossed by human beings. Whatever was limited in this world, made limitless by the artist and set free on the waves of transcendent emotions. And in another chapter, Moth and Mantra, he quotes from Hitopadesh, which is a knowledge book, very famous knowledge book in Sanskrit. Hangshaha shukli kritaha, yena shuklash chahariti kritaha. Swans are white, parrots are green, and peacocks are of variegated colors, yet they couldn't imagine or create the invisible. Only human beings, as artists, can capture the visible within the invisible and cross all limits. And in another chapter, which is called Shilpa Britti. I again quote from Bengali and I will summarize it. He writes, Shilpa Kajo, Manusher Antare Ebung Bahire Prokriti Shakti Sharup, Muhutte Muhutte Notun Path Sholtehai, Notun Katha Liktehai, Omrite Patro Puri Purno Kore Ditehai, Bahire O Antare Roshi. Shilpa Probritti, Alo Kik Chamutkari Kormo Kote Probritti. So art is Prakash. Art is described by Abhinindranath in Bageshwari 
Shilpa Prabandhavali as Prakash. The paintings which we may find here on the screen, they show such sort of relationship between within and without. They are fluid, they are porous, they are interiorized landscape, if we quote from, uh, I mean, borrow from Shiva Kumar's book on Abhinindranath Tagore. To the next slide, please. Let me help wrap up my portion. Yes. So, this book, Bagishwari Shilpa Prabhundhabali, is all about this, about the relationship between the within and without. And this continues what we, what we feel uh, throughout the life of Abhinindranath, uh, these tendencies of fluidity and porosity as strategies are very prominent in this phase when he painted and also lectured, but these are to be found from the very beginning and continued it till the end of his life when he was not painting but doing other sort of things. You should listen to these in due course from Professor Banerjee and also from uh, Devdotta Gupta. So let me come to the last slide of my portion of presentation and that is on Brotho. While talking about art, in Bhageshwari Shilpa Prabhundhavali, Abhinindranath focuses primarily on painting. While coming to Brotho, Banglar Brotho, the earlier text which was published in 1919 and came under the influence of the Swadeshi movement and the Bichitra Shabha, he in fact talks about the material desires and their fulfillment. Brothos are the rituals and they contain the Katha or the uh, story part or the, or, or the literary part and the alpana, which is the art uh, part of it. And they are all about the fulfillment of material desires of rural people. They are neither directly aesthetic nor purely religious, but they are probably belonging to a third genre. Again, we find the interplay between the two genres and we find the third genre. It seems to be a repressed my messes of nature. Human beings have already uh, severed their relationships from nature. They are, they are moving far away from nature. But they, the, the more they separate from nature for the fulfillment of the desire, they feel that they need nature and they fall back upon to cling. And uh, they, they, they try to cling to nature by creating art. They, uh, they create culture in order to naturalize themselves. It is an attempt of naturalizing culture and culturalizing, culturalizing nature. So, Avanindranath may appear in this text as an anthropologist. He talks about the lives of the rural people, their folk beliefs, their faith, etc., etc. He also makes several categories between, you know, uh, people's belief. But in the entire practice, we feel a deep love to understand human beings, ordinary human beings, relationship with nature. So with these words, I stop and uh, I would like to request Shoikot to carry the discussion forward. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone in California. Uh, I am heartily grateful to Professor Devashish Banerjee and the institution uh, for yes. giving us the opportunity and uh, uh, particularly Devashish sir who has been a constantly uh, constant presence in our work. He has constantly given us inputs and helped us develop this particular uh, topic. So as uh, sir has already told that he has spoken largely on the Bageshwari Shilpa Prabhundhavali and my part would be to discuss Banglar Broto and uh, to quote certain parts from that particular text and show how this particular interplay between the human and the non-human, how this border uh, between the nature and the culture, they are blurred, uh, they, they are entangled. That would be particularly the, uh, the topic of my discussion. However, for that, uh, I would just try to divide this particular uh, presentation in uh, a few parts first. I would try to define what do we actually mean by post-humanism because uh, when we had began this particular thinking of uh, working on 
Robin, uh, Obanindranath, uh, we did not think of uh, post-humanism as such. Rather, our uh, our idea was uh, something called, we used this particular term, uh, which was ecopoiesis. So I would rather try to define what do we mean by post-humanism and how do we look at post-humanism. Then uh, through, uh, through Bruno Latour's idea, I would also try to show how this nature culture shift uh, has emerged. And then gradually I'll, I'll try deciphering the text itself. So uh, when we talk about post-humanism, uh, post-humanism uh, for us, how, how we imagine post-humanism in this particular discussion is it's a discipline that emerged as a critique of humanism uh, and also human as a biological or a creaturely category, which is uh, in general terms perceived as an aspirational category, uh, which has been given a lot of terms like anthropocentrism. And then there has been a lot of uh, terms like the Anthropocene and, 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 and Anthropocene because it is obscene. There has been a lot of discussions on that. But particularly post-humanism as a, as a philosophical school would uh, tries to... Uh, decentralize human supremacy over other species as well as post-humanism uh, tries to imagine humans as part, uh, as an integral part of the natural organism rather being at some higher pedestal. However, as uh, Sir has already spoken that we are not talking about uh, uh, obliterating the boundary or completely deleting the boundary between nature, culture, human, non-human, but rather we are talking, uh, we're trying to talk about an entanglement. So here uh, we think that Francesca Ferrando's idea of post-humanism uh, would, would, would predominantly make the premises of this particular discussion, which is according to her, she says that post-humanism is a continuity, discontinuity and transcendence from the category of the human all at the same time. So it's a continuity, discontinuity, and also a transcendence. So that is going to frame the basic premise of this discussion. Now, while talking about this nature-culture divide, uh, I would be referring to Bruno Latour's uh, seminal book, uh, We Have Never Been Modern, where uh, Latour's definition of modernity hinges on a very specific understanding of the relations between humans and the rest of nature. Something, he gives a name, his name is the modern constitution and his ideas about political ecology involve the writing of that constitution to acknowledge the inseparability of humans from the rest of nature and while doing that while theorizing that uh, he says that this particular nature culture human non-human divide has has come through with two basic dimensions one he names as purification another he names as translation according to him the general perception is that to be modern is to be separate from the rest of nature. This is what Latour means by purification, the removal of the natural from the society. The very sharp divide in our thinking between the human social world and the rest of the nature. Therefore, the idea of the modern uh, dwells on the double ability to both separate nature and society, which he calls purification while at the same time absorbing elements of nature into society, which he calls translation, while simultaneously denying that this was happening. This power not only extends over the rest of nature, but it also allows a separation to be envisioned between the modern and the pre-modern. Now, that's why uh, for Latitude there is a certain uh, inclination towards the pre-modern because According to him, the pre-modern civilization is not essentially driven by the ideas of progress and decadence and a complete rift between nature culture and a complete rift between the human and the non-human because, because they are constantly entangled together. They are, they are not separated from each other, which, which, is a, which, is a, uh, which is a creation of enlightenment and modernity. So therefore, Latour points out, interestingly, and this is uh, this has been used in one of the seminal books of post-humanities written by Erika Kurdworth and Stephen Hobden, which is uh, known as the Emancipatory Project of Post-Humanities. In that particular book, Latour, Latour uh, they, they argue that Latour's point is that there is no nature as a separate realm. There is only one objective reality of which everything is a part and not two separate constitutions. Humans are subsumed within nature and it is only the false claim of modern constitution that separates the both. 
this particular blurring of boundaries we can see in Avonindranath, which is very, very conspicuous. So I would just refer a little towards to Bageshwari because uh, it was mostly Bageshwari what Sir had spoken and then I'll get into the Bangla Broto. This particular blurring of boundaries between unnatural and the cultural is evident in Bageshwari. And for that, I will use a quotation and I'll, I'll, I'll translate that in English. Uh, Tagore says that Je atodin chilo dorshok, she hoye boshlo potho prodorshok. Je atodin chilo drushta, she hoye boshlo ditiyo srushta. Who was the spectator then becomes the guide now. The viewer is transformed into the creator. Now this comment is an example of what I would intend to call Avonindranath's post-human ambivalence. Now why do I call it as ambivalence? Because uh, this particular comment can be interpreted in two ways. One is the transposition of the human self, the humanness completely into nature, thereby doing away or blurring with the nature culture rift. But it can also be interpreted as the positing of human agency as the supreme force in the process of art making or what one calls poiesis. Now this particular ambivalence is just not uh, a single instance or a single occurrence in the whole essay of a of, uh, whole text of Bhagishwari. It is occurred in another chapter which is known as uh, Drishti or Srishti, uh, which is known as Drishti or Srishti uh, or if you translate that in English it would be vision and creation. There it is very interesting he gives one non-human anecdote and then he also quotes uh, Goethe, the German romantic poet, and also Rabindranath Tagore. And these two quote, quotation and the anecdote would show that how his stance towards post-humanities is ambivalent. So, uh, I, I, I quote, I read the quotations, those organs that guide an animal are under man's guidance and control. This is from Goethe and from Rabindranath Tagore. The scene which the light brings before our eyes is inexpressibly great. But our seeing has not been as great as the scene presented to us. We have not fully seen. We have seen mere happenings, but not deeper truth, which is measureless joy. Now he is basically suggesting uh, throughout, the, throughout the chapter as well, he is suggesting that it is not just about the empirical seeing of nature, but there has to be that spark of creation. Now when you talk about this enhancing of abilities, it apparently sees that Tagore, uh, Tagore's uh, ideology is a little bit biased, a little bit inclined towards the human. However, the interesting thing comes up in his personal anecdote. It is his personal anecdote. Uh, he throws some breads to a crow, uh, which uh, the crow picks up from the soil. But when that particular bread uh, is thrown to an eagle, the eagle picks it up from the air. But after watching the eagle a few times, the crow learns that particular process. That means the crow enhances the ability. Therefore, even though he quotes Goethe, he quotes Rabindranath, talks about the spark of creation, etc., enhancing one's ability or trying to go beyond one's empirical uh, ideologies, uh, this non-human stance makes it very, very evident that his idea about this nature culture rift or even we can, if we call it the, the post-human stance, is pretty much ambiv ambivalent. Uh, it's pretty much ambivalent. On, on a different level also, uh, if we if we look at the word culture, uh, as, as Raymond Williams would point out in his book Keywords, that this word is, is derived from, from cultivation. So again, the, the production, the, pro the material productions or the artistic productions, they are essentially entangled with nature. And we will also have to imagine that man itself is just another animal dwelling on earth and has its roots embedded very much into the natural realm. Therefore, man's creation is an eventual derivative of nature. Thus, culture as man's creation has to be natural because of its roots. Here it is. Uh, uh, now, therefore, this is where Broto becomes important as it is for Tagore, neither art nor ritual, something which sir had just spoken towards the end of his uh, end of his talk. Uh, this also reiterates Tagore's ambivalent stance where the natural cultural realm is not obliterated but blurred. The border is not completely omitted but it is made porous. Tagore believed that the brothos grow out of intense human desire for a prosperous life world. Though the gulf between the strong will to live as human beings and 
its fulfillment in the world of living is being filled with both religious and artistic imaginings. The brothos can neither be branded as either purely art or religion. They exhibit some ritualistic features of the age-old Hindu religion alongside the unconditional joy of aesthetic creativity, no doubt. This may give us the canvas where we can interpret it as a case of ecopoiesis, what we had towards the initial stages when we started this particular writing together with Santanu sir, we, we, we thought of this as ecopoiesis, away from their cliched interpretations either in terms of art or religion. The brothos, namely, now I come to the brothos, which we will try to particularly speak about because the text is very dense, the text, text is immense. I mean, I mean, it can take hours to talk about the text itself. So we have just pointed out certain brothos and certain quotes from the text. So, uh, namely, Magmondol, Toshola, Bhaduli represent how human desires are intricately related with nature. For instance, it is in a direct dialogue between nature and human beings the well-being of the traveling male members of the family is desired and the subsequent human conversation with the river seems to be the fulfillment of that desire. The unique conversation can be found uh, uh, in, in, in Bhaduli where the nature and culture is in conversation. The, the Broto's name is Bhaduli Broto and, and I quote the, the, the song of that particular Broto, the performative ritual of that particular Broto goes something like this. Nodi Nodi Kotha Jao Bab bhaer barta dao. Nodi nodi kotha jao. Shoami shoshudir barta dao. So if I translate is, O river, where is your destination? Tell me about the well-being of our brothers and fathers, husbands and father-in-laws. The dialogue though, here must not be interpreted as a kind of worship in any conventional sense. It is akin to the floral patterns used in Alpona which are not pure art but markers of wish fulfillment. For example, this is, this is something, this, this particular slide, when we uh, attempted to create this slide, the, 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 the image visible uh, towards the right of that slide, this, is, this was created by Shantanu sir himself and, and he actually uh, pointed this towards me that how this is interesting because this is just a, this is just a part taken out from the, from the text but, but it is interesting See, the, the Alpona is in the middle, the top says Manush Ekeche and the down says Kolmi Lata. So even the text, how it is drawn or how it is, uh, uh, how it is created, the text itself becomes a, a visual narrative for us to understand how the nature culture realms are entangled with, with, each, with each other. Now for the Magmondol Broto, it is, an, it is a wonderful manifestation of the complete season cycle, particularly the winter in, in Bengal. The first section depicts the rise of the sun and doing away with the fog in winter. Uh, it, it, it goes something like this and, 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 and I, I will try to quote that there's the quotation there. Kua bhangum, kua bhangum, betlar age, shokol kua galo oi, bodoi gachti rage. Utho utho shurjo thakur jiki miki diya, so basically I'll try to summarize the poem depicts how the fog in winter becomes dense where there is a large foliage of trees and how the sun gradually rises through that. So therefore it is also a direct conversation between the sun and the performers. The second section talks about the sun's marriage with Chandrakala and the birth of their child Boshanto or the spring season. It goes something like this. Chandrakala Madhober Konna Meliya Dichen Kesh Tai Dekhiya Shurjo Thakur Phiren Nana Desh Chandrakala Madhober Konna Meliya Dichen Shadi Tai Dekhiya Shurjo Thakur Phiren Badi Badi Chandrakala Madhober Konna Gol Khadua Pai Tai Dekhiya Shurjo Thakur Biya Korte Chai now this is this is there is one thing this is very interesting particularly people who know bengali would understand this though we are talking about an exclusively academic uh, academic text we are doing an academic lecture but it is abhinandranath's brilliance which allows him uh, to keep the quirkishness of the word ba here because he doesn't use the word ba i mean the bengalis here would be understanding that ba and ba though they both mean marriage 
but they are different from each other. While BA would be referring to something elitist, standardized version of Bangla, where BA would represent the quirkish, the marginalized versions of Bangla, and and he he preserves that. It is not even uh, say a transposition of the thought. He preserves the actual quirkish identity of the text. Now in this particular poem here. Chandrakala means the waning stage of the moon and how in the winter the dusk in Bengal allows the sun and the moon to coexist in the same sky. This particular juxtaposition is imagined as a marriage of sun and the waning moon and they give birth to the next season that is spring or Boshanto in Bengali. In such a conversation now I would try to quote Heidegger's ideas from his text, uh, Letter on Humanism, where he says, the ability to transpose oneself into others and go along with them, with the Dasain in them, alre always already happens on the basis of man's Dasain and happens as Dasain for the being, thereof Dasain means being with others, precisely in the manner of Dasain, that is, existing with others. So Heidegger's idea of being is the being with the world, being with the other. However, his idea of being is human-centric and in his uh, another book that is uh, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, world, finitude, solitude, uh, he believes that the non-living world cannot offer itself to the human for the human transposition to happen. Thus, according to him, the human is world-forming, the animal is poor in the world, and the stone, or for that matter, the inanimate object, what he says is worldless. However, here we find that the Brothos subscribe to the idea of being with the world or being with the other. Yet, it critiques Heidegger's idea of worldlessness as it finds human transposition into the apparently non-living entities, for example, the river. This is only one example that we have quoted, but there are multiple. The question of the plant is also something that has been reassured through these brothos. Heidegger and even Derrida in his Beast and the Sovereign lectures leave the discussion of the plant unfinished. They address the animality of animal and the vegetable essence of the plants within the same dimension. Yet, they do not provide acknowledgement to the plants as much as animals. However, these brothos grant serious acknowledgement to the vegetable world through alponas such as Shankhalata, Chaltalata, Kolmilata. Therefore, the Western philosophers, even while discussing about the non-human life, neglect the plant, yet the highly anthropocentric Broto, through their cultural expressions, resurface the necessity and acknowledgement of the plants within the non-human realm. We may clearly imagine the possibility of human transposition taking place into the lifeless river in case of Bhaduli that is otherwise worldless for Heidegger. Through a linguistic dialogue with the other, the apparently sharp divide between the human and the natural realm is then gradually blotted in Avanindranath Tagore's text. The conspicuous resurfacing of the season cycle into the cultural expressions of the Magmondal Broto or even in case of Shijuti Broto, the nature constantly offers itself to the human self for its human transposition. Shijuti Broto, and I quote here, uh, it goes something like this. Kulgach kulgach kekudi, shotin beti mekudi, moina moina moina, shotin jano hoina. It, it, it basically talks about uh, a, a female, a woman's desire that his, her, her husband must not have another... Uh, his husband must not have another another mistress or or an extramarital affair or or or, or something like that. But while even that desire, uh, while at while she is attempting to fulfill that particular desire, the culture, the cultural, the artistic transposition happens in two things: one, the moina bird, and second, kulgach, the plum tree. Uh, therefore, these cultural manifestations are uncanny. This, this brothos are uncanny because at the same time they subscribe to Heidegger that is being with the other and also they critique Heidegger that the inanimate object is uh, the inanimate object is worldless for these brothos or for that matter Avanindranath these inanimate objects 
are not worldless. Therefore, they can be read as the uh, Derridian idea of the other other. In our conventional imagination, the nature has always been positioned in regard to culture with attempt to describe their coexistence in terms of sustainable development or even post-anthropocentric scholarship. On a different level, if there is a conversation between human and nature, the nature is an other to the human beings and if culture is created by the humans, it also becomes the other to its creators. While reading these brothos through Avanindranath Tagore's text, it appears that the human beings are responsible or as in Derrida, responding to one of the other, that is culture, while they are not necessarily irresponsible to the other other, that is nature. And the vice versa is also equally true. Therefore, every time there is an attempt to uh, respond to nature Dr. Grasp... Dr. Gupta, there maybe it might be better if he speaks at this point uh, Dr. Gupta, are you there? Yes, I am here sir Yes, would you like to uh, go next? It, it will be nice if you uh, if, you're if, you, if you say surely sir if you say surely mm. yes, and, uh, uh, Sir, thank you very much for having such opportunity to talk something about Abhinandanath Tagore's Kutu Jatra in such a great institutions and thanks to all the members of the institutions and thank you all and sir may I start to talk about Abhinandanath Tagore's Kutu Jatra now? Yes please. Okay so the thing when we are going to talk about Kutu Jatra it is definitely a kind of artwork by Avarinonat Tegor where we can see a specific conversation between his writings and illustrations or the artwork. But uh, when we see Khuddu Jatra, it is a 240 pages writings of Raman, reconstructed Raman by him. It is amazing and absolutely it is not like rest of the Avalinonat Tegos, how we know him. Uh, in the year 1934 and 35, approximately he started to write Raman in the style of the Jatra, a popular theatre in the round mode of Eastern India. He wanted to say it as Kuddu Jatra or the Kudiram Leela and illustrated it with collages. And uh, Josimuddin mentioned about this. I am translating his part. Josimuddin is writing in this way. One day I found Avanindranath sitting before a pile of newspapers cutting out pictures printed on them with utmost care. A wide range of advertisements. He was pasting them here and there on his manuscript of his jatra or play. The whole act seemed to be a whimsical child's play. He pasted a head of one image on the body of another. The images thereby gained a bizarre look. He stated, I am illustrating my book of the Jatra. This was what the poet Josimuddin had accounted in his book, Thakur Barir Aminai, for as a witness to making the Khuddur Brahman during his stay at Tegor houses. He adds, he had never paid heed to the news of the political climate of the world, however exciting they were. But I personally uh, don't agree with this point. This is not like that, that he was not actually very much politically conscious. Yes, he was politically conscious. That is why he had chosen 
many things for the Ramayana letters, for his illustrations. But regarding this, I would like to say one thing more, that he was just following the structure of Prithibashi Ramayana. The Ramayana was written in poetic manner by Prithibash Ojha, but he added many things here, which characters we actually don't see in the Ramayana as a whole. He added many characters here. He added Kudiram, he added Bidiram, many characters. With this particular name Ram is here we see in Kuddu Jatra. And this Jatra, we can say as if he is observing the Raman or the story of Raman around him, around him, around the socio-political structure of the time. He was not ignoring this. He was not ignoring this. That is the thing. That is why Kuddu Jatra is very interesting from all sides. One thing I must say, he Something we want to discuss about the posthumanistic structure. Uh, if I see towards the philosophical inquiry, uh, where it is clearly mentioned, the narrative engages with philosophical inquiries without the nature of humanity. And they are also telling something about the story might in unconventional narrative style. His making a picture for Kuddu Jatra was unconventional. His writing of Kuddu Jatra was very much unconventional. His competitive study with the character and appropriation with the Kuddu Jatra or the Raman was very much unconventional. So it is very interesting from all sides that when he was making Kuddu Jatra, it is not like the rest of the works of Abhinandana. We cannot compare it with the Bharat Mata. Even we cannot compare it with the with this rest of the pictures. Like uh, mm -hmm. Krishna Mangal series or the paintings of Mitya Shadja Shahjahan or like this. This Kutuchatra illustrations is not following any particular rule to establish the character of Ram, Shita, and anything. So this is very interesting. And there is a posthumanistic approach, also the postmodernist approach, where he is denying the conventional structure of seeing the Raman with the particular illustrations. And this is his characteristic feature when he was making the Kuddu Jatra. So I personally feel that Kuddu Raman was not too remote an attempt from what Dadaism aimed at. Decontextualizing found objects, overthrowing the iconoclastic monopoly of the prevalent art scenario. The enter khata or the excessive book of Kuddu Jatra is Abhinandranath's adoption of the story of the epic Raman, which he had not only reconstructed with desire and satirical bent of mind, also he reinterpreted it against a backdrop of the contemporaneous social happenings. That is the main feature of his making of Kuddu Jatra from where we can talk about that he is a postmodernist and he is not a revivalist only. And today uh, we are happy to discuss about Nirvana Tagore's work from the post-humanist culture also. This voluminous works bears the reflection of his transparent objectivity about the social and political phenomena in the world around him. Despite Josimuddin stating the fact that the creative genius never took any interest in the political scenario 
but i i don't think in this way because he is consciously cutting the picture of world over when he is thinking about the war between ram and ravan and in the second world war we know that there was two group in one side there was hitler there was mussolini on the other side the russia was there america was there france was there and the hitler and his team was probably supported by japanese administrations and our netaji subhashan goes to her uh, help from them and it is very interesting when you see that the soldiers of rama rama soldiers they are prepared they are taking the preparation at that time he is pasting the picture of tojo the japanese prime minister of that time and uh, tojo is preparing the guns and everything for the war so it is very interesting so i cannot say that avalinath was conscious i cannot so i am not uh, uh, are with uh, just not with do the volumna swaps so i want to say the volumna swaps bears a reflection of his transparent objectivity about the social and political phenomena in the world around him and uh, i reckon abhinandanat was largely knowledgeable in this particular field for his objective outlook about the current happenings rectified into the incorporation of newspaper clippings as such as you, you can say newspaper clippings and we can say the beauty is bathing in roman scandal we can say the dante's inferno the cinema poster we can say about the advertisements from onjika we can say about the advertisement published in the then time newspaper and many things he has taken from newspaper and many sources initially we uh, had a conception that he is taking many things from the newspaper but actually it is not like that he is taking many things from newspaper he is cutting the picture from the vishwarathi news he is cutting the picture from the panjika he is cutting the picture from the advertisements he is cutting the picture from the uh, journals and he is cutting the pictures from the handbills also the handbills used to come with the medicine packet and uh, perfumers uh, perfumes packets etc he is cutting everything from there so not only the newspaper and not only the magazine lots of sources are there from where he is taking the picture how to justify what actually he wanted to say this is almost we can say about we can talk about the appropriation this appropriation is one of the major elements of the postmodern attitude he is telling the story and creating two or three layers inside the ramayan his ramayan is not only based on kushidashi ramayan he is making a ramayan based on the social structure and social happenings around him so when we read his ramayan then we can see properly that his ramayan is a kind of alternative rama a kind of parallel rama what we can see around us so this kutub jatra is really very important 
from all sides and this kuddu jatra is telling us that he is not a revivalist one he is not thinking only the only about the god and goddesses he is not thinking only about the bharat mata he is not only thinking about the mughal style of style and culture he is not only thinking about the krishna mongol or krishna lila series his thinking procedure change the world scenario around us that time when he is making 34 34 35 35 is a very important time from all side in our bengal in the 30 to 35 this timeline is very important from all side 1935 we have seen the mahatma gandhi's gandhi march 1935 nandalal bos made his iconic linocut or woodcut painting based on gandhi march where you have seen the mahatma gandhi and 1930 he made the uh, arabarajan series 1930 30 dandi march 1930 not 35 sorry and 35 that means we are coming towards uh, we are coming with the world war and 30 is very important time from our side when he was making putum uh, katam he is making uh, arabarajani series and parallelly he is making kuddu jatra initially we thought that kuddu jatra is post arabian nights thinking but it is not post arabian nights because it is uh, it is a journey from 30 to 35 and we are getting now we are getting many advertisement he used which is actually the dating with 1930s or 29 also so 34 35 is the major part but 30 is starting point we can say and 30 means nanulal bosses gandhi 30 means is arabarajani and parallelly he started during 30s he wrote lots of jatrapala and ramayan came in it so we cannot ignore 30 so when we see the kuddu jatra illustration most of the print materials he used that was came in front of us between 1934 35 but some of the pictures he used in kuddu jatra the publication was came in, in front of us in the year 1930 so initially we thought it is a 34 to 39 but now we can add this is from 1930 to 39 39 pictures we got 30s pictures we got 34 35 pictures we got 35 he uh, took many references from the many books from vishwabharati and from art journals especially the four art journal which was published in the year 1935 so it's a journey of a long 10 years that is the point i want to say it's a journey and abhinandan's absurd ideas went further ahead challenging the prevalent genre of bengal school as well as the contemporaneous indian art he is challenging as if he is challenging himself that is a point He is not only challenging the prevalent genre of the Bengal school, as well as the contemporaneous Indian art. That means he is challenging himself also. Art in India thrived on uh, thrived on communions by patrons, and therefore its purpose was chiefly to cater the taste. And now he is coming out from this. is not catering any text initially uh, you can remember sir we have discussed that uh, when he is making the ramayan khudi or the khudro or the um, for the little paper the or the child and everything so he is breaking the classical structure of the ramayan this is one of the major point of the posthumous structure so this is very important that abhinandanath when he is doing his kuddu jatra he is actually challenging the prevalent genre of bengal school 
as well as the contemporaneous Indian art. Art in India at that time was catering chiefly the test or the classical test. This very reciprocation between the patron and the artist not only shaped the evolution of art in India, it had also brought about a stagnation to the freer and more painterly articulation of the artist. This had undoubtedly programmed the artist to a large extent, a barrier that was difficult to overcome. That time, Avanindrana came out from all this barrier. He came out from all this barrier. That is why he is an artist of modern and how he is taking the decision about the illustrations. That is why you can talk his attitude as a postmodern one. Although the advent of the British rule had brought about changes to which the Indian artist has had suitably adapted himself, like Cas Shadow, Chiaroscuro, Perspective, and other dramatically approved dimensions, such as the anatomical and proportionate depictions of what the eyes of the artist perceived. But to the creative mind, these would not suffice for a country that was much consumed by patriotic sentiments. It is almost invariably a good reason to probe for a way what would voice out its own identity and reflects its very unique philosophy and more specifically for India, its spirituality. The Bengal school of which Abhinindranath himself was the sole founder brought about fresh changes to the scenario. When, when a whimsical mind meets ceaseless versatility, the outcome is anything but a static end. Abhinindranath never confined himself to a single artistic production. He wrote plays, he wrote stories for the children, made sculptures whose queries we see suit his style best and even gave up career once and looked to playing instrumental music. His work, perhaps as a consequence to this, never regimented itself. It is like imposing challenge to one's own self very minute. Kuddu Jatra is one such challenge set to himself where the creative genius splurge on a task to explore his unconscious versatility. From this point of view, I would like to share some picture later on. But before that, I would like to minimize in my talk and coming towards the end, uh, the exploration of technique and handling the medium mark one of the major aspects of modernity. The artist has shown a remarkable playability while handling a novel medium. With such spontaneity has he illustrated the character of Jamboban with an imagines, images of a teddy bear. Vodok's returns with Rama's sandal has been depicted by a cut-up of an advertisement of shoes by Radu and company. The renowned shoemakers attached to this, he pasted a printed line from the book reads, religious faith, that driving forces. Such Splendidly hilarious approach is an unprecedented affair in the entire history of Indian art, which was often criticized by many as over romanticized as this 
applies more precisely to the Bengal school itself. Abhinandanath has successfully mingled the contemporary temperament with the ancient tale. Some more instances of this are illustrations of Sita's ornaments that she had dropped down to mark the course of the way to Lanka while she was being kidnapped and entire catalog from the jeweler was used for the purpose. Also, the widely used picture of vegetables that were prevalent in those days and which were printed use pictures of vegetables that were prevalent in those days in illustrated Bortola Ponjita, such as cabbages. And Abhinandanath is using it for, suppose, as old copy. Copy means the banner of the monkeys. So the old copies is appropriating with this picture and he is comparing it with the manners. He is using the picture of Kopi and the, he is using the picture of Kopi and word Kopi in Bengali means a cabbage or a vegetable. It also means the monkey. Abhinandanath illustrate the images of Moha Kopi, where Moha means the great and Kopi means the monkey or the ape, which an image of a cabbage of huge size. Strangely enough, the work also aims at what the modern day reader terms at interactive art. One of the pages comprised of a pair of two dimensional doors of stiff papers with the words a behind closed doors printed on them. The reader instinctively opens the doors to find out what is there on the other side that shows the photograph of a group of Southeast Asian women with ornaments. That just out from their heads. They are the women of the demon family who serve Ravana demon being of Lanka. So Kuddu Jatra or Kuddu Jamrila, as it also known as, being with the scribbled images of Lord Ganesha, whose image resembled with the Mridanga player. Written beneath it are the words Kuddur Amader Kuddur Jatra Tak Tak. The images of Ganesha as a Mridanga player is none other than the man whom Tegors had once patron Ganesh used to play his instrument during the evenings. The enchanted Abhinandanath had to painfully part with him when he later went to off to the king of Garbanga, who offered him to a better price. So Kuddu Jatra is therefore a fruit of a friendship that ended tragically, a reminiscence of a dear one at on the set. But it changes course, becomes adoption of the Raman. However, it is a blending of fun and gaiety that hints at one of the most progressive steps taken towards the modernity in the history of Indian art. That is my point, and uh, I am finishing my talk here, and now I would like to show some picture. May I show the picture, sir? This is the Forward Journal. It's a journal published in the year 1935, and just taken many pictures from this. And this particular journal came to uh, Jorashako Tegor House because at that time a big article was published in this volume on Amorindona Tegor. So by default, this journal came to his house and he is using 
the picture printed in it for his Uddhu Chatra illustrations. In the left, there is a uh, advertisement by Bengal Nagpur Railway. A picture of rail engine is there. And in the right side, the illustration of the Kuddu Jatra pages. In these pages, he is talking something about the Kavando, a particular character mentioned in the Ramayana. And Kavando is telling to Ram that uh, inside me, everything is burning. Inside me, everything is burning like a hot water. Inside me, there is a fire. It is, it is, uh, Pabandha is telling this particular feelings to Ram. And here, interestingly, Abhinandana Tagore is illustrating these pages with the steam engine picture. He has taken this picture from the Bengal Lakpur uh, railway advertisement. Why steam engine? Inside the steam engine, inside the boiler, what is there? Uh, hot water, it is burning always. As if this steam engine is now the character of Kavandu. It is, it is exactly his teeth and everything. It is his eyes. And inside him, there is a huge burning. Inside him, there is a huge hot water and everything is there. So it, this, this steam engine, context and decontext, there is a context. In particular, in this advertisement, this is an advertisement for Calcutta Bombay via NAPU, a super service. And decontextualizing this, and this steam engine now has become as a character of carbon. And it is very interesting when we see this particular advertisement, this is from Byron's band. This Byron's band was for quality mineral water. And there is a soda fountain. And Abhinandana Tagore is clearly writing here that Ravan Raja, he has a room where he used to drink the soda water. And this kind of addition is very much new. And when he is thinking this, he is cutting and pasting this part, this part. He cut this particular part and pasted here. And the Juri Dohar, they are telling it, Ravon Raja Pan Korar Soda Fountain, Soda Fountain Pan Koribar Ghar. It's the room where Ravan is to drink the soda water. So he is pasting this picture in this particular page. And we have to stop over here uh, because I think we are running out of time. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, also, I, I'll be, so we, if we have some time left over, we can also discuss a little more. Okay, sir. I, okay. I also wanted to point out that last image that you showed of the soda water, it, it has sir. a emblem with the with the swastika in it. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. Where you see the swastika. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because he's making that kind of connection uh, throughout with uh, Hitler. Hitler's Germany. Yes. So yes. if you don't mind, uh, we'll stop over here and uh, we'll continue yes, and we can get a little more okay, time sir. if possible. Thank you very okay, much. Sir. Okay, sir. My paper is called, before I begin, I would also like to say a little bit about what has transpired so far, which is that we, we've had three talks. Uh, the first two were regarding a text by uh, Avalindranath. Both of them were about texts, actually. Uh, the first one was his text on aesthetics called Bhageshwari Lecture, which is lectures on art that he gave. And Dr. Shankaran Banerjee was talking about how that text is actually challenging some of the norms of humanism. And Shoykot followed that by talking about another text. And these are uh, sort of mid 
career of works also towards the end of Aurobindo's late mid career works. Um, his it's te, it's a text on his uh, study of folk designs, alpona, which are related to rituals. So I, I will draw on some of these in my talk itself, and we can discuss it more later. And Dr. Gupta was talking about. And even later, as he pointed out in the chronology, 1930 to 1935, uh, around the time of the Second World War, um, he's writing folk plays, Jatra. A Jatra is a folk play. And he's using this form, uh, just like he's using the form of the, of the, of the Alpona, which is a folk, uh, you know, to designs done in rituals uh, of the people, popular rituals. These are not Vedic rituals. These are rituals that belong to people and they're participatory rituals, not mediated rituals. And so similarly, you find that in this uh, text, we are talking about plays that are done by the people in which grand characters like Rama are turned into common people of the street. So Khuddur Jatra, Khuddur Ram, Ramayon, uh, Khuddur means little, of the little, the, the book of the little Ramas. And the characters in there are shopkeeper Rama or seller Rama, buyer Rama, and things like that. See, so this is a way, at, as Dr. Gupta pointed out, of uh, bringing the epic and the grand into the modern and the, you know, commonplace. Uh, so my uh, talk is about the final phase of Avalindranath's work, which goes from 1941 to 1951. This is the last phase of his life. It's called Avalindranath's Found Wood Relatives, Narration, Nomadic Subjectivity and Trans Subjectivity in multimedia rituals of destitution and restitution. We also learned about the multimedia aspect of his work already from most of these talks that he's mixing media, he's mixing senses, and these are each given a certain independence that they're allowed to dialogue with one another. This is part of the postmodernity of his work. So in 1938, Abhinindranath Tagore's elder brother Gaganendranath, who was also an artist, died after eight years of paralysis. In 1941, his uncle Rabindranath followed. He also died in 1941. Later that year, Abhinindranath moved from his ancestral home, 5 Dwarkanath Tagore Lane, to a rented mansion, Gupta Nibash, in Varanagar, which is a area towards the outskirts, uh, the suburbs of Kolkata. That same year, shortly after his move, his wife, Suhasini Devi, his life companion for 53 years, passed away. And in a couple of years, in 1943, the ancestral house of the Tagores, the Jorashankur Tagores, was sold. These changes represented the end of an era for Abhinindana, the crumbling of a communitarian manifestation related to the forces of history. It could be considered the end of what flowered as the Bengal Renaissance in regional and national history and the end of a feudal aristocracy with the advent of the Second World War. It presaged the arrival of a new phase of modernity that of capitalist individualism and the politics of nation states. Post-colonial nationalism may largely be thought to replicate the humanist image of the cogito, that is, the human as independent rational subject, albeit in an ethnocentric flavor. So there's an ethnocentricism to it, but the image of the human remains the same. It's a the rational subject. I have argued elsewhere that Abhinindranath's cultural nationalism 
proposed an alternate dialogic idea of the nation. Now, Dr. Shantanu Banerjee mentioned that uh, fact and the book that I wrote about it called The Alternate Nation of Abhulindranath Thakur, where he is proposing a different kind of nationalism. And I don't have time to go into that right now, but maybe we'll touch on some of that as we go along. One, in which the senses were delinked from the cogito. So this is something we've seen already in all the works that we've been introduced to. The senses, it is not as if the, the cogito, the thinking aspect of the mind, the, the, the rational ego, is uniting the senses. It is not uniting the senses and giving them a certain unified subjectivity. It is allowed to let the senses free so that what we have are independent approaches to reality from each of the senses. The senses were delinked from the cogito and put into historical dialogue with one another. Each one is experiencing the world as a different historical phenomenology. We see this from the very start in the calligraphic intertextuality of his Krishna Leela paintings. So, uh, see if I can this. so again, I'm not going to go into depth with this. This is all in my in my book, but these are his earliest paintings. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we heard some talks on uh, art related to Krishna. This is one of the scenes uh, from Krishna's uh, dalliances with the gopis, with Radha and the gopis. Uh, it's called Nau Bihar. Uh, and the name there, Nau Bihar, is written on the top in Bengali. And actually, the naming is interesting and important because the name belongs to the texts of singing, kirtan, pala kirtan, you know, where they sang episodes from the life of Krishna. And you see, under almost half the page is made up with this calligraphic writing. So this is part of that delinking of the senses. You have, you have the vision and you have the text. But the text is also visual, it's calligraphic. And there is a historicity to it because the text is written in a specific font. It's the script of uh, Islamic writing, Nastalik script. This Nastalik script is actually writing a Bengali uh, verse by a poet called Gyandas and he is talking about Krishna in this. In this. And so there are layers of history and religion that are actually being brought together in these images. So we see that this is the intertextuality of his Krishna Leela paintings. In his later paintings such as the Arabian Nights, this was also mentioned by Dr. Gupta, uh, which what we, he, he called it Arabo uh, uh, Rajuni, and this is being done in the 1930s, early 1930s. So you see here in the scene, this is uh, Shahrzadi is talking to her father to convince him to take her to the king and get her married uh, to him. And this is her sister, Dinar Sadi. And again, the calligraphy on the top, there is the same similar intertextuality. That calligraphy is in Urdu. And it is the kind of Urdu uh, which is spoken on the street from um, narratives that were being written uh, in street Urdu in, in India, in Kolkata. In his later paintings such as the Arabian Night series of the early 1930s or his collaged manuscripts of plays such as Kudrup Chakra, which we just saw, we just saw, this is another page from that very same book that uh, Dr. Gupta was talking about. Uh, the historical phenomenology is inscribed into the contemporary and the local. This is what he was talking about. You see that this epic tale has been transposed into our times. And you are getting a certain kind of a, a, a sort of palimpsest where a, a very different type of uh, sociocultural uh, 
you know, flavor is merged with, with the epic soups. It should be noted that many of these texts, along with the dialogue of image and text, I, are also referencing the performative. This is again what we saw uh, in Shoikov's presentation. He's talking about these folk rituals, right, which he's writing a book on and the diagrams, the images that belong to the folk ritual. So you can't take the image out of the ritual. Similarly, this page is actually the page of a text or drama to be enacted. So it's, it's like the visual aspect and the reading aspect are connected with the performative aspect. Mm -hmm. So it's the image and the performance. All the three works mentioned above, and I also spoke about uh, the Krishna Leela paintings which belong to the singing traditions, the Kirtan tradition, uh, are of this kind. The Krishna Leela paintings are each inscribed with titles and texts taken from books of Pala Kirtan meant to be sung. The Arabian Nights paintings are storytelling episodes inscribed with popular Urdu narrations and the Jatras are meant to be enacted. Three media, image, text and performance are thus engaged over a temporality that overcoats the present with the unfinished virtual memory of history. These are clearly cultural practices of postmodernism. However, even these practices appealed to an individual subject. So in a way that there is a certain individual subject involved, even though there is a certain challenging or complicating, though complicated with respect to rational agency and historical temporality. So the, the historicity is challenged as well as the rational agency is challenged. Still, an independent individual subject is assumed. In this last phase of his life in Gupta Mibash, Abhinindranath seemed to find himself in a personal and historical landscape of destitution. A loss of context and consequent loss of text and of subject. And I am using the term subject both as a grammatical signifier as well as a, as a, a kind of an ontological signifier. The text is, the context is gone, the text is gone, the subject is also gone. Yeah. Mm. He had few, if any, companions from the past and experienced increasingly a sense of utilitarian abjection, the uselessness of waste. In his writings of this late period, we find him frequently using the words pala, meaning discarded, and paltu, meaning without utility. As if in a materialization of his subjective condition, shortly before his departure from Jorashanko, a little female street urchin walked uninvited into his darkened and mostly empty second floor quarters. He welcomed her and gave her the name Pala. After moving to Boranagor, he retired his brush and spent part of the morning walking around the rented house picking up natural and human debris or discards. He brought these to his room and spent a good deal of time inspecting them and working on them with small tools and touches of color. However, the finished products of these manipulations did not wear the looks of easily recognizable objects. Crafted from objects of nature or human artifacts that had lost their social coding, they were seldom returned to the world of existing codes and contexts. Instead, they retained their liminal ambiguity as objects of potentia waiting to be born. Like them, the artist too, his coding erased in an alienated world, waited in latency for conditions of individuation. Such conditions were always unexpected and unpredictable and always temporary. And the individuations or heseities these conditions called forth were always new and always temporal. 
They most often included the arrival of children such as Pala or other little people, Khuddur or children, grandchildren into his world. To such arrivals, Abhinindranath often introduced these objects, sometimes calling them Katum Kutum and sometimes Kutum Kata. Kat translates as wood and Kutum as relative, but Katam bears also the connotations of kata or kart as well as kathamo, frame or type. Thus, relatives in wood crafted wood relatives or relative typologies. To these human friends or relatives, he would introduce his wooden relatives with typal names given in performative improvisations of fictioning in which Temporal ontologies involving himself, the object, and the addressee would manifest as states of aspiration or darshan. The performance over the object, the addressee, and himself would lose their names and return to a state of potentia, awaiting new conditions for collective individuation. Rani Chondo a young girl and intimate of the family has written a book on such objects. I'm indebted to Dr. Gupta for providing me that book, which is very difficult to obtain at this point. Uh, and some descriptions of the performances in which Abhinindranath mobilized them. Here, for example, is a description of a first encounter related to these relations in book. Quote, Abhinindranath said, I I'm, I'm, by my translation, I'm not reading the Bengali. I have captured a stork today. A twinkle of laughter in his eyes, he said, what a beautiful stork. The smile now touched his lips. He said, both wings outspread, he is flying an endless journey. Abhinindranath stops a while and starts again. He is journeying in the blue sky, over sun-dazzled cornfields, he is journeying. All alone, he is journeying. Laughter lights once more his face. You see, Abhinindranath makes to lift his right hand from where it lies on his lap and retracts his gesture. Again lifted, again put back. In that raising of an arm, as though the magic of stock revelation is hidden. Such is his pretense. Avanindranath's hand makes minor movements and I become anxious with expectancy. Avanindranath casts a surreptitious glance into the front pocket of his Punjabi and lifting a somber head raises his gaze to the sky. But for me, I have clearly understood that in that front pocket is the mysterious torque that is flying in the blue sky and forever flying. I am agitated with curiosity. Moving his hand casually towards the front pocket, Abhinindranath says, Oh, so you'll see. His hand gradually proceeding towards the pocket. Okay, then let's show you. And once more he withdraws his hand. No, Baba, let it be, he says. Expressing raptness through both his eyes, oh, what glory of those years of corn in the morning sunlight, and how beautiful his call as he flies. Now I'll show you, shall I show it to you? So saying, Abhinindranath, in one moment, in reality, produces from his pocket a box. A square, flat, thin, black and white cigarette box with black stripes prevalent in those days packing inside 10 cigarettes side by side. With the closed box in his hands, he begins smiling. Shall I open it? He says. But what if it flies off? Well, let's open it. Caution, don't speak. It will be upset if it hears humans. See, I hope, I hope there is no one else around. 
the thing is not for all to see. So saying, resting the box on the flat of his left palm, okay, let's open it. But keep watch, it doesn't fly off. So saying, with great trepidation, he opens the lid with his right hand. He says, now see, a tiny stork chipped out of wood, strung on fine wire, its two ends fixed to the two ends of the box. At the center, the tiny stork on the shiny tin plate, as though against an infinite sky, is flying alone, spreading its two wings on two sides. Avanindranath holds his left hand, which has the box with the stork a little higher. See, hear how it calls as it flies. So saying, he begins to undulate his hand very slowly. The knots of the wire when rocked, touching the body of the tin plate, set off a sweetly stirring reverberation. Kong, kong. Abhinindranath says, did you hear? And here, see how the cornfield shimmers in the sunlight. The ears of corn sway in the breeze. On the shining tin plate, the play of light, light and shade has made to appear paddy fields, vast stretches, infinite horizons. In that tiny black and white box, making the stalk fly through the finite and the infinite, Avanindranath laughs and I laugh. To theorize this activity in terms of cultural production, one needs to note the inadequacy of categorizing it either as found wood sculpture, abstract expression, or performative art. The first two are static objects of display and aesthetic consumption. Even if they are forms of restitution, they code the uncoded or recode the decoded. Returning the object to the humanist ontology of independent subjecthood of which it was a discard. Here instead, outside the performance, the object loses its code once more, returning to the state of destitution. The third, performative art, is mostly a critical intervention which belongs equally to the human, humanist ontology of independent subjects. But usually when we talk about performative art, it's, it's a critical performance. It also belongs to the humanist ontology. It is only certain forms of performative arts of participatory fictioning that open up a genre to which these object performances are more appropriate. As visual creations, these objects are potential in relation forming abstract typologies. These are genetic typologies. These are not structures that are static. They're genetic structures. Abstract typologies that express singular qualia under specific spatio-temporal conditions. Instead of seeking a new coded subjecthood in a new humanist ontology, Avanindranath through these practices held out a nomadic refusal of code a retention of imperceptibility, waiting for local and temporal conditions for creative performances of collective individuation with the cultural discards of diasporic scattering. Such nomadic individuations hold the sing signal for a post-human polity of creative anarchy. This is a kind of a hint in that direction. However, Lacking an intuition of the typologies formed by the related potential and hence the performances giving them singularity and individuation, they return to being discards. This is what in fact has happened after his passing. To, the mo to mo most of the remaining examples of our Abhinindranath's found wood relatives, names lost, locked in glass cabinets in museums, they have returned to the uncoded imperceptibility and destitution from which they came. I end with a few examples of Kartum Kutum from Rani Chando's book. So you can see some of these examples. And in fact, 
she has retained the names so that is one aspect of them at least if you know the name it, you, you suddenly capture the sense of how this can be used in a performance and how there is a certain kind of realism to it the more you look at it but if you didn't know the name you wouldn't even know how it can how, be used. How big are they? Little like things. Little, little, yeah, little yeah. things. But you would know that that was an animal. You could see that it's an yeah. animal, yeah. A cricket. <laughs> uh, and these were made when? 41 to 51. And he named the dog. So, so they named only during the time of the oh, performance. So this is one example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you said that. Yeah, right there. So it can mm. decode itself again. Yeah. 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 A horse. So then the question: Who named? Like, did you add this? No, this is the this the book. person. Oh, yeah, the okay, person. Sorry, yeah. The, the the person I quoted. So he gave a lot of these to, to her afterwards, and she kept them. So. Mm -hmm. Is she the only one who wrote it down? Uh, no, a few people did, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh. Wow. <laughs> this is a, a, a actual photo of Rabindranath, and I'm showing this because you see a certain posture in which he's characteristically shown in profile with a slight stoop. And Abhinandranath is going to use this 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 type this typology, you may say, to make uh, his own replicas of his uncle. This is one of them, Lobika. He used to call him so. It's as if he's stooping over. And this one is Abhinandranath on a boat. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, I think we are out of time, but if there are some questions or if there are some comments, even from the participants, maybe we can take a, a kind of five minutes or so. Thank you, Devashish. That was so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, when you read the quotation about this little cigarette box, I mean, I had a very felt experience of of this object that was created and, and experiencing it. And it's interesting to think if he had intentions to have it spoken like that, that even without this object in front of yeah, him. Yeah, because that's a way of, that, that that's its own immortality, right? Yeah, it, yeah. it sort of uh, keeps it alive. Uh, so that, that's also an oral performance, but it's a written down oral performance, as it were. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very interesting, and I'm not sure whether he intended it, probably didn't. Mm -hmm. And he was sharing it mostly, as I said, with children. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, maybe he was going <coughs> to inspire them to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Yeah. Don't know. I wanted to also mention about the 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 the, the folk, uh, I mean the Alpona because this that that in a, in a way is similar. Uh, they are also temporary. Uh, mm. Firstly, they are rituals of participation, as I mentioned. Uh, they are not rituals of mediation, which is what pujas are. Mm -hmm. These are people, uh, collectively, particularly women, and one of the things, he makes a distinction between Aryan and non aryan It's part of his amateur anthropology, right? So, Vedic and non-Vedic, Aryan and non aryan And he's saying that this is non aryan performance. And in the sense that... Uh, the non-Aryan performances he's saying in the text are, have been wiped out, but particularly it has been retained by, uh, you know, Kurna Brutu. In other words, maiden, unmarried women's, uh, because they're the, they're the least noticeable in, that, in society. 
they are the ones whose rituals live on today. Mm -hmm. And it's done by them collectively, so they kind of produce these designs which are nature, which are kind of like mimetic of nature, but at the same time they are participatory and they mediate between nature and humanity, culture and nature, and produce these forms of aspirations. Mm -hmm. And forms of individuation. And so in that sense, these rituals, uh, they're rituals of individuation. Margaret, have a related. Yes, Margaret. And after well, the job. First, I just wanted to thank all of you. I felt like a, a cup in which knowledge was being poured. There were so many facets that um, of integral consciousness that was shared by all the presenters. I want to thank you. Um, and interestingly, Debashish, you going last was like an emphasis of all the previous points being made, and especially the quote and experience of, of the little girl watching <clears throat> the cigarette case. The experience of that, it wasn't just you reading. We, we were experiencing the flying. <laughs> anyway, it was profound in that sense and demonstrated his brilliance, his genius, and his consciousness. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, could you say a little bit more about the difference between trans subjectivity and traumatic subjectivity? Because in terms of some of the larger theme, in terms of finding and building an alternate happiness, happiness one would be more opening beyond the confines, the decoding, but then talking about how is it that Again, this, this the act of you know, disrupting, that was another thing, continuity, continuity, discontinuity, but this disruption and this, the idea of without utility or without subject, yeah. it, it kind of, the way I'm hearing is it gave him an opportunity to disrupt that. And it seems like the fictioning when you said that is really a, a link between that goal of becoming, but opening you to the unthinkable goal, which is the act of creative act. Yeah. You know, actually, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm posing it as a post-human act in which uh, there's a collective individuation taking place. But we may question that as well, because in a way, the collective individuation is kind of, you know, the collective is partly the non-human itself, but the non-human orchestrated by the artist. You see, because he's, He's, he's claiming interaction, he's giving it life, you know, that, that's also what we were talking about with regard to uh, Shargat and uh, Shantanu Babu's papers, that, you know, that the non-human is not poor of world, you know, the non-human belongs to the world equally as in challenging Heidegger's understanding. And, and you know, it comes into the world because it's, it's not a kind of a in position, it's not uh, a hylomorphism, mm -hmm. you see. So it, 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 it has its own uh, vitality, its own animism, which is uh, participating in this individuation. And the child's vitality is also participating in the individuation. But it is not, not neither of these are participating at the same level of participation and agency as the artist, you see. So a truly collective or true collective individuation uh, would, you know, have a, maybe an even nomadic subjectivity of a more full uh, agency, I, I feel. And then the other thing is that uh, with regard to nomadic subjectivity and trans subjectivity, uh, you see Deleuze is talking about nomadic subjectivity when he's in anti-Oedipus, when he's talking about the war machine. And the war machine is in a relationship with the state uh, in our times because we can hardly expect anything more. See, it's, it's becoming imperceptible and finding the, the, the strategies to individuate under totally universalized conditions that are hostile. But uh, if you're going to talk trans individuation, we, we have to think about alternative habituses 
uh, that can last, that can have some sustaining power. So this is, it's almost like uh, it is better not to have a code than to be appropriated in your code. You know, this term appropriation was used. It's as soon as you have a code, you will be appropriated. This is, this is the story of all the revolutions of our time. And in a way, Deleuze, most of his work is addressing the revolution of 1968 and the fact that it was immediately appropriate. So how do we remain un inappro unappropriated by you know, refusing uh, coding, remaining imperceptible? And so these are temporal acts of individuation. That's why they're nomadic. But on the other hand, if they could find some security, they could, they could be a collective, um, you know, I mean, understanding of this kind of a collective individuation. That would be a trans individuation. That would have some sustaining power. Create another world. This other people. This world of another people. Any other? Any comments, discussions from the participants? Sasha has a comment. Sasha. It makes me think about um, processing speed and like neurological makeups. And I'm curious about if, if he had a neuropsychological evaluation, how they would discover his processing to be. Because it makes me curious about the way to go back to the beginning of your lecture about the use of the senses, not as a uniting force, but to allow them each to have their own. And that in that, it takes space mm. to access that. Yeah. Kind of knowing through the senses in that way. And and that with a slower processing speed. Yeah. A person is able to better or more naturally do that. Do that. Yeah. But it's, I also it's a very interesting very question. Interesting. And you can actually see it in some of his texts. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was also a writer. We did not, I mean, of course, the Jata texts are written texts, but he was also a literary writer. Mm -hmm. So, and those literary texts are very hypnotic. You know, he, he says, actually, I write images. And the way in which he writes those images, actually, if you go through them, they speed up and slow down. You know, there's a way in which they mess with your sense of time, you know. And sometimes they become more hypnotic and sometimes they actually become faster. Uh, and I think that entire uh, question, I think in these all these works that we are discussing, we are seeing how he is uh, actually intervening in your neurological process. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, he's kind of, uh, you know, forcing you to change your conditioning. Mm -hmm. And that's very post-human too. Yeah, right. This that's, experience. That's, that's sort of between the post-modern and the post-human. Okay, interesting. Interesting, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.